Hey everybody, I'm Jesse Camp and welcome to Street Rock. On this episode, we are... Today's episode, fantastic guest, 1998. If you watched MTV like I did, you know this guy. They had a contest called Find a New MTV VJ. This guy won it, Jesse Camp. Hey guys, that is Jesse Camp. You're listening to Van Halen, man. He won the contest, became a VJ, was a smash hit all over America. You're gonna find out what happened, how he got that gig, his childhood, everything. It was fantastic. He's above ground, he exists. He walks the streets of Hollywood, talking and rocking. Jesse Kent. We are outside of Dean Del Rey's house. So, we're doing a podcast with him today. He doesn't know we're here yet. We're just gonna go up, yeah, knock on the do door. It. Here he is! <laughs> motherfucker, you're late. I know I am. Dean, I thought we, we killed two birds with one stone. We're doing the podcast and, and doing this show. Yeah, live in the Hollywood Hills right here, rock and roll. Dude, How are you guys? This is an insane house. Is man. that even plugged in, dude? No. Oh, I got you. Just go there. Yeah, it's a prop bike. Yeah, man. The word is out. Word is out. Like the candles of rock. How are you guys, man? Killer. Oh, Burn. it's epic to see you. Hell yeah, Jess. Thank you so much for having me. This guy, look at this guy. Let's go I in. I didn't want to disappoint. No way, come on in, man. We got some shit to talk about up here. All right. Let's see what you got, Tom. Check, you to check. Yo, check it, a check, 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 the one, two. Check, check, check. I think, uh, hold on. Oh, yeah. Uh, what's your cord? Black or lead cord? The black cord. No longer blackened. <laughs> okay. Let's fuck it. All right, now let's see. Party. We're ready to rip. Party, party. Yeah. Okay. Quick check here, and we'll be partying. You like to party? Yeah. What do you got? I like the party, yo. Okay. I like what's hot. Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay. All right, here we go. Let there be talk. Uh, I got a crazy guest today. Uh, I did the live podcast a couple days ago at the uh, Laugh Factory with Jim Florentine. Yes. I see this tall, crazy dude wearing the fucking uh, Steven Tyler style uh, vibe. <sighs> And, I'm, and then you start talking to me, and after about five minutes, I realize, wait, I know this fucking guy, and, and it's Jesse Kemp from MTV Days. That's right, man, in the flesh. Now, what, here, I'm, here's I'm excited as hell to see Mr. Dean Del Rey in the flesh. Here's what's weird as fuck. Two things. What were you doing there? What's weird as fuck is that you have a chimpanzee in the corner in a weird cage. Yeah. This is like amazing, Dean. This is mini Michael Jackson house, dude. Oh my god. Do you 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 have an ape like a bubbles type thing? I do. You see him over there, man. His name's Squirrel. <laughs> He's a chimpanzee, but his name's Squirrel. <laughs> How many bananas does that mofo go through a day? Yeah, see, this is exactly how I thought the this interview would go. This is a crazy <laughs> setup you have here. You have a whole pool in the back with live flamingos. Yeah, yeah. I swear, this is like insane. It's like Las Vegas in the Hollywood Hills. It's amazing. Dude, you're filming it. They're looking. They're going to be looking at it going, there's nothing here. <laughs> Actually, you can't say stuff <laughs> oh, like that because I, I try to get donations and then they'll yeah. think I'm shady. Oh, for the animal reserve that you have here? No, man, for the fucking show. Now let's the talk show. a couple minutes. Uh, yeah. What brought you down to the show? Basically, um, oh, what brought me down to the show Thursday night yeah. at the Laugh Factory, where I do believe if you're lucky enough to come to Hollywood, you can catch Dean on a semi-regular basis. You play yep. there a lot. I'm at the comedy store every night in the Laugh Factory about twice a week. But what brought you there? Did you know it was a oh, rock show? Well, um, I'm good. For, 
I'm not going to say good friends, but I, I'll put it to you this way. I love Jim Florentine. That's right. He's a great guy, right? The greatest guy. And, like, there's just... But I'm kind of picking up that vibe from you, too. Yeah. But he, Jim Florentine's, like, one of those guys that you uh, you just look at and he makes you laugh. Like, just, just seeing his face, I'm thinking, like... What is he thinking in his head? And yeah. then his weird kind of monotone voice. got the, got the voice. deepest voice, right? Yeah, absolutely. No. And then, of course, you know, I mean, I, I was a huge Crank Yankers fan, and yeah. he, he did arguably the best character on that. You know, hey, it's my birthday, yay! <laughs> I mean... Now, and, let's, talk, let's talk a little bit, because you're uh, one of those guys to me that... Uh, out of sight, out of mind. You know I'm hard I mean? to pin down. <laughs> One day I'm an MTV VJ. The next day you hear about me, you know, like uh, opening a, a humongous high rise in Dubai. You know, <laughs> I mean. Uh, now the, wait, a, hold on a minute. Now, so you, I, I remember what was it, 1998, right? You enter right. a contest to be a VJ on MTV. At yeah. the time, VJ had some weight. You could get some BJs. You could get some chicks, right? I mean, that shit was still kind of cool. <laughs> A VJ <laughs> could get a BJ. Right, yeah. You know. Hey, but you, these man. days a DJ can definitely get a BJ. A, a, uh, a club? You mean like a like Skrillex yeah, guy? Yeah, for I sure. I mean, I'll, I'll break Dean and I'm happy to do it. And um, I'll tell you all about my my uh, my life and yeah. um, whole MTV period. And yeah. All my subsequent craziness and I want to talk about that because growing up, I grew up in the 80s. And uh, where are you from originally? San Francisco Bay Area. That's right. And right. you do a lot of great. You actually, guys, honestly, you have a lot of great material. Oh, thank you, man. I, I had a friend that I, I was telling uh, her about you, and then uh, yeah, she was, she's uh, yeah, that drag queen. That, but now I'm, I'm glad that didn't work out because I'm glad it's just you and me. But I, I yeah, have, I mean, you want to bring another a drag podcast. Queen. <laughs> I have another podcast subject for you if yeah. we could get her again. Yeah, but yeah. Like yeah. crazy. Well, some would think you're a drag queen. Right? <laughs> I got your time. Well, the with truth, you. Dean, and no one knows this, but I'll let it out here: is that I was born a hermaphrodite. Right. And so, you know, like much like Jamie Lee Curtis. Right. Right. You know. And I get it. Okay, by I the way, you want to know the number one yogurt in the uh, in, right. in the hermaphrodite community? Yeah. It's Activia. Well, <laughs> and that's all because of Jamie Lee Curtis's endorsement. Those Activia people, you know, there are a lot of hermaphrodites out there, and they're pooping regularly with that Activia. Is that right? Yeah. I don't even know what the fuck you're talking about, but let's get into some rock and roll. <laughs> yes, yeah, let's get on rock. Because so, in addition to all the MTV stuff, I yeah. don't know if you know this, but it's great timing because uh, May 25th yeah. is going to be the 15th uh, anniversary of uh, the release of my uh, first record that yeah. I made. Now, we're, we're jumping way too forward, though, because yeah. I don't want to get into that yet. Because okay. Here, let's get into it. 80s, I'm watching MTV. You sure. got the VJs. You got Mark Curry. You got fucking... Uh, Ricky Rackman. Yeah, Ricky Rackman, uh, Headbangers. But what are those other guys? They were actually like five. Downtown Julie Brown. Adam. In the beginning, you had Martha Quinn. Yep. Uh, Nina Blackwood. J.J. Jackson. There you go. Um, the guy with the afro, yeah, I want, Mar uh, Mark, Mark Curry, maybe Mark Curry, Mark Curry, and then Alan Hunter. Okay, there you go. Those are the guys. Those are the guys that started it. They launch it. It's big as fuck. Nineteen eighty-two, first video ever. The Buggles radio killed the. That's right. Video killed the radio. Star. Yep. And then you, it, it becomes huge, obviously. And at some point, some of the VJs leave for to do other stuff, and they go on. They have a contest, search for a new MTV VJ. Oh well, we're plowing through a lot of history. Cause Are we? Yeah. I mean, because the honestly, the history of MTV is vast, and if we just touch on this for like a I'm, millisecond, I'm down. It'll make my, where my place in the whole history. I'm of down. It, that much more poignant and is interesting because. I mean, uh, you know, we live in a digital age, you know, um, and so, I mean, you have to really understand, basically, uh, when I was at MTV, it was 1998, and it was, like, the very last era, like, where people would buy, like, you know, records and CDs. Right, yeah, right, like, right, uh, right. But they had that stuff, like, um, I remember, like, the... You, they would have, uh, during the day, you could vote for a video every day to win. Remember yeah. that? Like, to keep TRL. that video going. TRL. Yeah, and that's that's a big part of what I did at MTV is um, 
it's re- I was in there during a really crazy period because, uh, uh, you know, for the first year of that show, TRL, I was, uh, what you know, the, the guy in the street, you know. That's so right. That's I right. basically saw that show go from, like, you know, it being, like, ghosts in Times Square, like, you know, like, Times Square is a little dead around, like, 4.30, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, that's right. To, like, it being, like, a, you know, like, 20,000 people in Times Square, like, it was New Year's Eve because the Backstreet Boys are there, you know? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, it's crazy, right? Crazy, yeah. yeah. So let's so let's talk a little bit about it. Uh, you grew up in, I mean, and there's, like, the, you yeah. know, people say, oh, the guy was rich. Who, who cares? You created a character. I get it. Uh, in a lot oh, of- I could tell you. I'll give you 100% the facts of, yeah, let's uh, get into that. of my economics. And right. This is some interesting stuff. Yeah. Now you I grow feel- up in the East Coast? I feel like I'm on a first date. <laughs> it's good, though. No, it's good. It's no, good. because you got to understand yeah. the magnitude of MTV of oh, me growing yeah. up. Let me explain where I'm from and yep. geographically and, and my upbringings. Long story short, um, and I won't give out my mom's maiden name or my social security number while doing this. But right. um, basically, my um, my name, uh, my birth name is Josiah Holden Camp the third. Right. And I grew up. Uh, I was born in Hartford, Connecticut. I grew up in Granby, Connecticut, which is like right on the uh, uh, rich th- neighborhood. No, no. I mean, decent though. Yeah. It's like a, a suburb of Hartford, but there's a big difference between being a suburb of Hartford and being like a suburb of like Greenwich or Stamford or right. something. Because like, like we were like basically like ten minutes from like Massachusetts. Like, so it was kind of. Granby was a town that was on the cusp of like you know working class, but then it had like some rich people too. But my mom and dad were both teachers, and uh, my dad was a history professor. And then my mom was like the principal of the school of the elementary school in my town. But long story short, yep. my, my uh, mom was born and raised in the Netherlands, and then she came over to America when she was nineteen. And then she was like taken like a. And then my dad was a little bit older. He just started uh, teaching at the University of Hartford, Connecticut. And then she was she wasn't a student of his, but they met there, and so yada yada yada. Right, right. Anyway, at what so time? basically the whole MTV story right. with me is nuts. So right. like I I was a good student. My parents um probably brought in about like 120 grand a year back then, which would be like a, a you know the upper middle yeah, class. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, but I not get like it. rich. Yeah, I get it. But I went to a great. You see what changed my life is I went to a great private school right like for high school and that's the shit that people grabbed on to right right because you created a character that you were a street kid yeah and uh which but is- i really became one and the thing is is uh you know i was one of the yeah I, but by the time i was doing the mtv thing you see i was 18 and when you're 18 you know and you're so into a movement you know what i mean I getcha. like yeah i was like so into the street kid kind of like vibe and aesthetic that i did like actually forget in my head oh yeah yeah but i think what was even cooler about all that is just for that time period um you know how much stuff i was able to get over at mtv basically the thing is is that they like, didn't do any research no once i won this contest mtv put together like this half hour special about my life yeah and you know and the thing is is um uh, yeah, I mean, it was all a head trip because they did really kind of create a character, you know. Of the did Jesse they create it or did you? Oh, I 100% created it. Because that made t- them think it was me. Right. If anybody is like a kind of an Andy Kaufman. That's right. That's I right. I was like a real life Andy Kaufman. Well, Bobcat like, did character, you know, a huge comedian. Bobcat created a character. Uh, yeah. Different people create characters. And as much as they want to fry you when they find out. Uh, in your mind, uh, you're not going to get it as a regular guy. You need to pop out. You need to have something. So are you at your house going, I'm going to enter this contest and I'm going to come on as like a, a street well, kid? Well, the thing is, is that when I was 18, I was like a mix of uh, crazy confidence. Yeah. And um, see, the story really starts when I was at that private high school, right. um, which was actually a, such a cool school because... Basically, it was like the high school in my town was cool, was like kind of deadbeat. But like, you know, this this school was like it was like half day students, which I was and then half boarders. Kind of like a, a an art kind of school or what, almost what kind like of an art. Yeah, very right. much an art school. Right. I got into acting and theater there. And then basically like my senior year of high school, 
I had like a uh, a scholarship to for an acting program at UCLA. So my mom and dad thought that um, I was gonna basically go there. Right. But I um, <laughs> you know, and so and then at the same time, I I had an older sister, Marisha, and she'd been going to NYU for like two years, but she dropped out, kept some tuition money without it getting back to my mom and dad somehow. So yeah, basically like. You know, like the, my mom and dad, we had a Sitco gas card and the mobile gas card, and we were on our way. Basically, right after I graduated high school, and, gas and like cards the are the key to the city, right? Oh yeah. Because uh, I had one, like I was dead broke, but my mom gave me a shell card, and she'd be like, "If you get in any trouble, just use the card." And then once they put those uh, those little markets in there, now you're eating. You can get cigarettes. You can get beer. You know? Yeah. Oh, and check this out. If you have a Listen, I think that the Sitco Gas Company maybe is not as prominent as it was like 20 years ago. I remember ago. back then, yeah. But, I mean, the, it's an East Coast station. Yeah, but then there's this thing where like so many Sitcos are joined to 7-Elevens. Yeah. And it used to be that like, so shit, you could like just shop at the 7-Eleven. You could just live on these yeah. gas carts. The deal is, is that the bill would then go back to my exactly. mom and dad. That's exactly what happened to me too. My mom would be like, what the hell? Two hundred dollar gas bill. And I'd be like, I, I, I need to survive, <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's so, funny shit. Now, so you're, like, you're, long story short, yeah. basically, like, we took off. We had the gas cards. We had money. My sister and I went on like a nine month, like, road trip, and we did come out to L.A. and and but we had crazy adventures from like Gallup, New Mexico, to like. Boise, Idaho, we ended up living with like a religious cult for two weeks, but then we were like, we had crazy adventures. Yeah, like modern day hippies. Modern day hippies, we had a crazy adventure where it was like around Halloween and Jane's Addiction. We're like uh, reunited in this 98, and they were like playing like at the uh, Sahara Hotel in Las Vegas. Yeah, with uh, Navarro. With Navarro and Flea on base. Right. And they were making this whole movie about it, and then this like guy like scouted me out for it and gave me like an acting part in that and I did that and so that was all even before MTV but then basically right. it was like Mar it was like February of 1998 yep and like you know me and my sister we had like this brown Volvo and it was kind of on its last legs and there was just something in us that was like okay we've kind of done this long enough we really need to get back home yeah. give our parents a break from worrying just a little, did the old find you know. yourself thing yeah and so then my sister was totally fried when we got back but she had been living in New York the last two years, and, and it seemed really interesting to me. So then, basically, like in March, I started, like, what I would do is I would take, like, the I would basically go to go into New York City, hang out there for five days, take the bus back on the weekends, recuperate, and do it again. Yeah. And I had some weird... Where are you hanging out at? Like, the limelight and shit like that? Um, are you clubbing or what's going no, on? No, not even clubbing, man. What just, are you doing? Just, just like fucking, fucking exploring. I was still so young that, yeah. like, you know. Are you doing drugs? You out drugging and stuff? Yeah, my in my own way, man, yeah. but not you know innocent stuff. Yeah, not, yeah, just weed or something. Just weed, yeah, right, right. right. Yeah, now you gotta be like you're. But it's all new and it's so exciting. Now listen, at this point, I had explored like everywhere else in the country from like dubuque iowa well not everywhere but most everywhere right right so i was really like hip to the road and stuff but new york was like this new urban crazy cool adventure so anyway basically like two weeks i'm in like uh mtv announces this contest that it's like anyone who wants can like um you know come down to their Times square studio and try out to be a vj right and so i was like you know um yeah like who's not gonna do that right he's not gonna do that also, the thing about how I changed my name to Jesse is that um, basically I remember on that road trip, me and my sister, we, we'd gone to Graceland. Yeah. And, she, you know, my sister had an Elvis obsession and he had a brother named Jesse. And, you know, we were just like, wow, Jesse, that that's kind of the coolest name. And I was like, yeah, that's the dopest name. So then when I entered the MTV contest, they asked me my name, said my name's Jesse Cam. Now, in your but mind, I in did your mind, kind though, of create you, a you know, right. like, did you have the character in your mind going to the uh, audition <coughs> or did you just sort of? Yeah, I, it was sort of like how at that time I thought to sound cool, you'd sound cool. And I was, you know, into punk rock at the time. I was also very into, like, uh, 80s hard rock. And I was, you know, which was really kind of unhip at that time. Because in 1998... Yeah, because grunge still... had killed it all. Listen, I got to tell you, and I'm not going to tell anyone where they're all stored, but I have, like, a, a rock t-shirt collection that's wow. fucking... 
the Japanese shit's... were to find it, it could be worth. Yeah, that millions. shit's great, right? Like recently, like about. But in 1998, you could like fucking like you could actually go into a Goodwill, just buy go them all. The remember? T-shirt racks. There'd be Trickster T-shirts, Britney yeah. Fox T-shirts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like people. Oh, yeah, I, 99 cents, right? 99 cents. You know, when I'm on the road now doing comedy, I search them out, you know, and you'll score an Iron Maiden peace of mind or something. But, uh, yeah. I, like a lot of people don't understand. Like you can see in my house, I got a shitload of rock memorabilia, and it, it, it's. Are we going to be cool. lucky to go in there after? Well, just you for can, a minute? You can see it here, right here. You know, like there's oh, belt yeah. buckles, there's Zeppelin, a King Diamond. King Diamond. Those are some early belt buckles. But over so there, you're a huge rock fan. Oh, God, yeah, dude. Look oh, at me. <laughs> I got to tell you another interesting story. So, like, when I was in, this is pre-MTV. This is, like, November of 1997. So Motley Crue are on their Generation Swine tour. Yeah. Who's singing on that? Is that Vince, Vince? Neil? Oh, he's back. And I'm going to tell you this. Generation Swine is my favorite Motley Crue record. Really? Well, that you know what I always say? Afraid is their best song. I always say it's whatever record you discover the band on usually has. No, I knew them, man. I oh, remember yeah. buying Dr. Feelgood on tape cassette. Tape cassette. I love it. <laughs> so I get it. That record just No, it blows it. my mind. Also, yeah. with all my mil- tons of T-shirts... I didn't. I mean, I used to be a mad ass tape collector. Yeah, I, I mean, just I, sold my cassettes. With hold on, you're gonna wish you had. Why? Because I went into some like store. Yeah, hipster stores. Hipster That's where stores. I sell them, man. They sell them for fifteen, twenty bucks now. What the fuck? Can you believe it? So I was getting like eight and ten dollars a piece. I've only got a few left there that they wouldn't take. But I had shit like you know, what, like a Doro Pesh? Nah, you know, like uh, Lita Ford, you know, Wicked. You know, why would they not take Lita Ford? Yeah, well, hipsters don't want that. They want stuff like Maiden, Judas Priest. Yeah, Saxon. but that's the obvious shit. They the have cool that's shit. The stuff they want. The cool shit, listen. Yeah. Let me tell you this. Okay. For your listeners, and if you want to get into metal, you guys got to know that I'm true. I'm hardcore. Yeah. Give me a bet and let me see if I can name all Lita Ford's albums. Okay. All right. Out for Blood. Right. Dancing on the Edge. That's it. That's the one they wouldn't take, but go ahead. You got to let go. Yeah. Isn't that on there? Then I think there was an album made with Tony Iommi, Tony Iommi that was never released. Yep. And then, um, then a big breakthrough produced by the amazing Mike Chapman, Lita. Fucking great. Yeah. And then followed up by fucking awesome record. I remember buying this on tape cassette on the same day I bought Steve Vai, Passion of Warfare. What? Yeah, Lita Ford <laughs> Stiletto came yeah. out. Yeah, which one had, if I close my eyes. Forever. That's Lita. Lita. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. Lita. Lita. Yeah. Crazy. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, close a- your eyes. Yeah, yeah. You've got to close your eyes for me. <laughs> close it like a palm of my hand. Let's say it in love for you. <laughs> like a dagger. You stick me in the heart. <laughs> Put the blood through my veins. <laughs> if I close my eyes forever. forever. <laughs> Will it all remain the same? Yeah, man. But then, you know what other song was on that one? Why one? I went to a party last Saturday oh, yeah. night. I didn't get laid. I got in the fight. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. It, it ain't, ain't no, no big thing. thing. Right? Late for work and the traffic was bad. Had to borrow 10 bucks from my old man. Uh-huh. <laughs> it ain't no big thing. But you know what I like. You know I like dancing with you. Love that was followed up, though. Finally thing. The final thing yep. is that Stiletto was followed up by arguably Lita Ford's best album, Dangerous Curves, yeah, oh, yeah. which is the <laughs> fucking excellent album. But that came out in 1992, I think, when you know all that yeah. shit was on the wane. But that had like I, was, I wasn't listening to that. I think I was on fucking. You're probably uh, into some grunge at that, that point. Man in the box. But dude. you know what? That's an interesting thing. Is that like in, in from nine? Like if you were to take a lot of the the biggest hair metal bands, yep. and the albums they released from like 1993 to 95, you have so many undiscovered. Gems, but that's I when you do the have gems. the Motley Crew self title with John Karabi. You have Tesla Bust a Nut, yeah. you have like Cinderella Still Climbing, 
I mean, like, see, and here's the thing. I'm a huge rock fan. I love Cinderella, Long Cold Winter. What a fucking great record. First record, fantastic. I, 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 I don't think that is a good record. You know what I mean? Which one? The, the later ones. Uh, and I okay. think because I don't just give up on bands. I always clown on people like, you know, like right now, Kings of Leon. Like, how come nobody's buying Kings of Leon? They're fucking still good. You know what I mean? But people just wait. Are you talking about like that new album? That's like I take one in the temple. Yeah. I take one for you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That one. That's a good album. It's not bad, actually. But what I'm saying is, uh, grunge came at the right time, I think. Oh, yeah, no, it's all good. But you gotta understand then where where I came in is like I um when I was in high school, listen, my freshman year of high school, Kurt Cobain killed himself. Right. So um basically coming from that point, it was a weird like ninety five, ninety six was strange. Like the Grateful Dead were huge where I was at, like right, the yeah, Dave Matthews upstate. stuff. Totally. I got really into Blues punk. Blues Traveler. Yeah. And that Horde stuff, that kind yeah, of shit. Yeah, yeah. Right? That that made that was huge. That jam band shit was huge. Just trust Afarian rock. Yeah. Right. But then basically towards the end of I mean, and then you had bands like Bush. Yeah. I remember a couple of times, see, I'm a huge comedy fan, like even um like being in high school and like when my sister was living in New York, she would I had the best sister ever. She would get like standby tickets to Saturday Night Live. Oh, sick. And then so like, you know, I, but this was like when Saturday Night Live was in that like post Chris Farley building yeah. era. Who was the like like it was like cast? Will Ferrell's like second first it was like Will Ferrell's like first year. Yeah, oh, he's and, great. Like, yeah, you know, I mean like so but it was like the only time in SNL history when it was actually easy to get like tickets. Yeah, because the, the people didn't know who the people were yet. Yeah. I gotcha. And then later <laughs> it gets red hot again and it's hard yeah, to get in. During that time period, I remember going down and seeing like Robert Downey Jr. host, uh, oh, seeing was, like yeah, I remember seeing that. like Bush as the musical guest. So like that was that weird period. So you go to the audition, you For step MTV, up to the yeah. camera, and what do you do? You're just like, hey, this is oh, Jesse yeah, Camp, man. It's... I want to be on MTV, <laughs> motherfucker. That kind of shit. Well, I was kind of. Like sly about it, you know what I mean? Like yeah. putting in like subliminal charm, because basically, like it's like what you don't say. So like, they basically like, yeah, you you go in, you say your name, and then you like read a cue card, and you read like another cue card at another thing. Yep. Oh, you're gonna love this. Yeah, I am. This <laughs> another fucking twist. Ooh, this another twist on the story. Uh huh. That gets us back to um, Jim Florentine. Yeah. It's oh Don, yeah, Don Jameson finds you here. Yeah, Don Jameson. So basically, like they're going through like the audition tapes because basically how this contest worked is like you know basically, well like I think they ended up having something like five or six thousand people like like actually come down and like you know audition go, go audition which was just like the craziest thing. And then, can you imagine it now? It'd probably be fifty thousand. Yeah, you know, you know what? what? Here's the here's the other thing you got to remember, and this is a big thing to like the story is that this all happened pre American Idol, right? Pre The Voice, yeah. Pre America's Got Pre Talent. Kim Kardashian sucking a pre dick to get Kim famous. Kardashian. This is this is. 15 years show. 15 years ago pre all the reality show so the fact that MTV was doing this was groundbreaking groundbreaking in fact MTV doesn't get the credit it deserves in reality TV because I mean they started it really with the real world you right know? oh yeah oh yeah I mean yeah, that was they did I mean that was really uh they and then then what they did with the osbournes was really revolutionary that yeah. was another great thing that's what killed i got MTV. to be a part of right it, it because killed it but the times killed it i yeah. mean no what really People killed weren't, weren't watching videos anymore i get it but also when you're making it all reality shows you're like where the fuck are well, the video no what killed the video aspect of it quite honestly is two things i mean Number one, YouTube. Basically, yeah. you totally. can watch anything you your want favorite right video you want whenever you want. You know what I mean? But I mean, yeah. And then the other thing is, um, yeah, 
Well, basically YouTube, but then like, well, you know. Well, you got to think now. There's a station. Also, then MTV kind of splintered off. They made MTV2. Yeah. They made all these other MTVs. So if you buy the expensive cable package, you could still watch like 24-hour videos. You video. can. But the thing is, I think that they didn't adjust to uh, like live by the kid, die by the kids. You know what I'm saying? Uh, if we, the kids are united, the, the kids they'll are, never be divided. The, the kids are your audience. I understand that. That's why they had VH1 for older people. But they have that one station right now. What do you remember it? when VH1 was seriously like Celine Dion <coughs> and Michael Bolton videos? I do. I do. That was kind of cool. And Hall and Oates and, Hall and, and Genesis. Right? Yeah. No Invisible Touch. That. And like you know, you're but no then son VH1 of mine. VH1 Classic came, and VH1 were like, Classic is the shit. Was the was the shit when it first came out? Right. I tell you, I had such a crazy nut that when VH1 Classic first came out, I would buy. I would, because I was like, holy shit, they're playing every video ever made. And I realized that they had like these eight hour cycles, and then they'd repeat it another eight out like the same eight hours, yeah. like a twenty four hour thing. So I'd get like an eight hour videotape. And like record eight hours of VH1 Classic at some point during the day, every single day. I right. still have like a box of like a million VH1 Classic videos. So you go in, and then they're <laughs> skimming through the tapes, and Don Jameson is one of the like yeah, guys he's one watching. Of the people. Yeah, Don Jameson <coughs> is one of the people. Um, you know, picking Are, contestants. Is he, is he working at MTV at the yeah, time? Yeah, Don. I guess Don was ambitious, and you know. He was probably 10 years older than me. Maybe he was in his mid-20s, late 20s or something. He was working at, yeah, he was he was working at MTV in production or something. And so, you know, wow. they saw my tape. And then a couple of people were like, no, I don't think so. But he was like, no, no, we need to... You've, we need to have this kid. Yeah. So anyway. Well, he saw a vision that I would see too, which I see uh, like right now going on in comedy. If you have all the same stuff all the time and you bring back a different flavor, people will grab onto it. You know what I mean? Like, oh, this guy's crazy. And anything you have like, oh, he's rock or, oh, I don't like him. You have people talking yeah. and that's what you need over a VJ. So, he saw that probably. I mean, you know, I don't know if you know this, Dean, but, you know, Russell Brand has come out several times and said, you know, that I'm his number one influence. Is that right? Yeah. For real? Yeah. I've never heard that, but that's real? Absolutely. Wow. So You, you know, know, a lot of what I did laid the groundwork for Avril Lavigne. You wow. Know, and, sh you know, I mean, I was kind of like ahead of my time, you know, just a little too early, but... But and there were there were a lot of factors. Too. Let's uh, let's talk for one minute now. You you look exactly like you did then. Uh, you uh, you're older, obviously, but yeah. you look rock and roll. You have the same cool. kind of stuff. You have the exact kind of boots, skinny jeans. You know, it's that G and R appetite look. Exactly. <laughs> I know the look. I, yeah. I wore it myself, hundred percent. And I love that you still rock the look, which is cool. But when you uh. When you went for the audition, was that your look, or did you fabricate it like I'm going to go in as a rock and roll guy, like an old '80s? No, genre? no, that's no. That's how you looked in New York. No, no, that's how I looked. Okay. Yeah. And why did you look like that? Were you into uh, '80s rock that you missed? Or well, my look was actually—I'll tell you—I've um, always been uh, thrift store junkie. Yeah. Like you know, that was you yeah, know. I love that shit myself. Yeah. Except for it all fits like shitty. You know, it's thrift fit stores now rock. and in LA, they're not what they were. No, I no, mean. because it's worth money now. You know. Yeah. But I'm, I, I know what you're talking about. I mean, back in the day, you go in a thrift store, you get like a badass pair of sunglasses, some cowboy boots, and a fucking leather jacket that some, uh, oh, you know, grandfather left to his kids, and you yeah, roll out for I like mean, eighty bucks, and you'd be rocking. Oh yeah, and like the Goodwill on Vine in particular, and then yeah. there used to be this other place. <laughs> I was. Uh, called Studio Wardrobe that was on Highland. Right. I don't know if you remember this place. I don't know that one. It was run by this insane guy named Rick. And, like, um, <laughs> he was a burned-out hippie. Yeah. But, like, you know, like, he basically had, like, the f he would have, like, truckloads from China somehow of, yeah. like, all the, like, the fucking greatest, like, finds. But then you'd be like, hey, Rick, I'm going to, you know, take this. That's fine. Well, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, so that, so. So you go. Where am I going got, with all so this? So you've got your look. 
Yeah, you so, go in. Oh, yeah, you're, I'm no, Jesse Camp. What's up? And then people. The only thing I fabricated was um, my voice because uh, right because it's hilarious because yeah. when you ta- started talking to me in front of the Laugh Factory, I was like, I know this fucking voice, which creeped me out. What's scary is that after all these years. <laughs> like I had a time period like 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 probably like two or three years after the whole MTV thing where I really saw the magnitude of like oh, oh you know I blew this I didn't blow this but I could have made this so much cooler by just actually having been myself but that was the trouble having that happen like when I was literally 18 well yeah you I know, mean like Polly Shore created the wheeze people but right th- but and here's the thing is I think psychologically um, you do intrinsically know that it's much cooler to make it a hundred percent from the street up, you know, than it is to kind of take a fast break. And this VJ contest was going to be my fast break gotcha. all along. My plan was, um, and my big dream, you know, coming out of high school was to form like like a new Motley Crue or like a new Aerosmith. Right. And like Hanoi were, Rocks was the band singer, I was obsessed were you in with. Singer band? Were you a singer before? Uh, before you uh, started VJing, like, did you try? To- yeah, I did sing, but I mean, I, I I played guitar, I played the saxophone, I played the drums. And you loved Hanoi Rocks. Loved Hanoi Rocks. That's interesting that you love Motley Crue because uh, you know, right? Razzle killed uh, no, yeah. Ra- yeah. Vince Neasel drunkenly killed yeah. Razzle somewhere in Hermosa Beach or somewhere. Uh, somewhere, but I I, I never I never say he killed anyone because you know how it goes, and this is a true. Fact. Oh yeah, listen, I have five vehicular manslaughter charges yeah. pending, right, so right. I understand what it's like. Well, you know? what I'm saying, and I feel is bad for the families. Whenever you drink, I'm just night- kidding. And in <laughs> fact, I just the minute I made that horrendous joke, no, I have. Yeah. No. No, but what no. I'm saying is, I, honestly, I never drive fucked up in the '80s That's, when you're partying. Yeah, the other guys partying with you. It's not so. If he had the car, he would have drove. You but know you know what? Can I tell you something? Yeah. Again, I'm kind of sitting here like a grandpa because I'm thinking about how beautiful the times are now. Yeah, I mean, we there's a lot that I miss about how simple times were like in the '80s. But then, I mean, it's amazing now in 2014. Vince, I believe that too. Vince Neil could have just gotten on his iPhone and called himself an Uber. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. I believe I believe a uh, life could have been saved. Yeah. Maybe maybe this Uber thing, you know, finally taking over the monopolization of like old school taxi cabs is a really healthy healthy thing, you know. I, I mean, think the Uber guy is going to end up killing people. These cocksuckers, man, on Sunset. If you got a new bit about Uber, this is edgy and this is a good bit to to develop. Well, here's the fucking thing, man. Those guys just park on Sunset. They get a text and they don't even look and they just fucking <laughs> U-turn on Sunset <laughs> and, you know, and, and I'm coming down Sunset on my motorcycle. I was like, whoa, what the fuck, dude? They yeah. don't even care. They've got to, I got to get that dry ride before someone gives me a bad review. So those guys are going to kill people. I'll tell you an interesting thing. See, this is what's great about a podcast. We could tell all kinds of... We'll get... We're, no, we I have our it. main narrative, yeah, which is do. my We've life got story. We've our main thread. Our main thread. Our main thread is but Jesse. But it's okay. Yeah. All which, those, by like, the way, I got to tell the audience, you definitely came over stone because when I opened the door, you just smell like weed, right? So that's cool. I don't smoke weed, but you're still rocking the uh, weed, which is nice. <laughs> All right. I mean, I think it must be coming from your neighbor's house all right, or all something. Right. What, you don't cop No, drugs? I mean, I love to see, Of course uh, I do. I hope so. Oh, yeah. So okay. I just didn't want to have to go into a whole drug history, nah, but I can. That. Let's get into this now. So you yeah. get, you know, they're voting for you now. Jim, or uh, uh, Don Jameson says Don you got to get this guy. Yeah, so they, basically they narrow it from, um, you know, like 5,000 5, people to 10. 10. And then, and so basically, this is between a Monday and a Wednesday. And then, like, that's as long as the vote's going? That's how long it takes for, they have auditions, I think, on Monday and Tuesday. And then on Wednesday, like, the final 10 are revealed. I gotcha. So they had to go through, like, a lot of wow. takes and a lot of shit. But then, basically, so then my, I, I, I had the number, this is pre cell phones. I had the number of, like, my sister's um, roommate. Uh, from college and so like I gave that as my contact number and uh-huh. so then I called from a payphone just to see she was like oh you gotta come over here right now MTV just called and said like you know you're one of the ten finalists wow so like she, you know she put me in a cab sent me to Times Square I jump out there 
it's like three o'clock. I go through the line. I'm like, hi, I'm, you know, blah, blah, blah. They said to come. They're like, oh, yes, come with me. Now you're and doing so then, the voice then, now. A, no, I'm not doing the voice. Oh, or am I? Okay. No, I'm saying when you're uh, oh. there. Now, in your mind, you go, wait, I got to get doing this voice? Like, no, because that was so psychologically crazy because, like, I lived that character. I became that character. I mean, I... I really took an Alice Cooper type trip with that character. Now, what made you do want to do but a then, voice though? Is what I'm saying. Why not be just you right here, Jesse? Because you're already because I hadn't crazy. figured out who I was gotcha, at that point. Gotcha. Yeah, you're just nervous. You want to create a character to hide and behind. I get it. That, but also that it was basically like that's kind of what I did to win the contest. Right. And now you're locked in. Well, you know, all I was thinking going into the contest is let me kind of like do this character and let me kind of, you know, I was purposely stupid in a way that I knew would get laughs. Right. You know yeah. what I mean? I get it. And when I, when I saw how successful this was going, yeah. you know, I'm like, okay, shit, this is my way in. I can tell you like the day after the contest was life changing. I remember taking like the path train. My sister came down to like see me. By this point, MTV had put me up in a hotel, and right. so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was a whirlwind. It was from, like, nothing to everything, like, now, overnight. Wait, who um, had basically, uh, he had managed Run DMC in the beginning, and he had managed, like, uh, Ed Lover and Dr. Dre and Michael Monroe from Hanoi Rocks. And, right. Like, some random things. And so then, basically, he was my manager. This guy was also kind of actually, like, instrumental in keeping me at MTV because there were a, a number of times... You see, I mean, my character got really big. This is really kind of what happened is like my character got really big um, at MTV, but it was all also based on kind of like this, um, you know, danger kind of persona. You know what I mean? That you didn't know what you were going to do. And there were a couple of times on TRL, which was like a live broadcast where I like I did a couple of crazy things. Which, right, right. Right, because you're now... Which didn't seem that crazy to me, but like but spitting a piece of gum out or things like, like that. Like your character's crazy, so you have to do some yeah. crazy stuff. You can't be safe and fake, right? So yeah. you got to push a couple buttons, then you're getting in trouble. Yeah, at the same time, you got to understand, like, I'm an 18-year-old with, like, the keys to the city. Yeah. So, like, I'm, like, partying my ass off, you know, and... Um, Are you getting money? Well, here's the thing is that... Um, I mean, I don't really want to get into finances, but you know, I'm actually really, I'm at, I'm at, I'm, I'm very good financially now. You know, in a place where I can kind of just live my life and I don't have to worry. Yeah. You know, but um, basically, you know, but all, that's from like my hard work the last like you know bunch of years. But I was gonna say that basically, like, uh, where I made like the majority of my money from that time period wasn't really from MTV, but it was um, from a publishing deal that I signed with oh, for, a record deal. Oh, record deal, yeah. yeah so you got I, a publishing advance on the songs. Yeah. Did you sell your publishing? I think we went like fifty-fifty. Right, right. With a it. bunch of co co right, you know, basically on that album. I mean, that album's a great album. I mean, and we so had you're a signed dream to Hollywood lineup. Records, which was Disney's label. They had the Scream. <laughs> Uh, who signed you, they Rachel had, Matthews? No, um, Rob Cavallo. Rob Cavallo, there you go, huge A and R guy. Huge A and R guy. His dad, Bob Cavallo, um, signed Prince and yep. was Prince's manager forever. And basically, it was a really interesting time at Hollywood Records. They had, like you said, they had had the scream, and basically, since the mid '90s, they were trying to make a name. And get like a breakthrough act, and in 1990, like eight, Rob Cavallo took over, so it was perfect time. We basically um, met with two record labels based from a, like a. I did a two song. Basically, Charlie Stetler, the manager, knew a guy, Rick Browdy, and he had produced like Poison's first record and Faster Pussycat and stuff, and Ted Nugent, and so um, he put together like this band, which was um, uh, Cher from the band Vixen. Yep. Um, Joe and Bam from a band Dogs to More and then this uh, other guy who's amazing Alex Kane from this band Life, Sex and Death I know Alex Kane he played in my band dude for six months That's you know insane. Alex Kane dude I can't believe it so, Alex Kane never brought me up dude no here's the thing uh, this was before the 98 this is uh, and Mike Varney goes hey this kid from Chicago is pretty good check him out uh, he had a beard he looked like Ted Nugent uh, he flew out. We picked him up at the airport. His beard was gone, and we we're like, "Whoa, this guy's scary looking." And he had some like number eight oh five or something tattooed on his face, and uh, 
He played with us for about, I don't know, six months. And then we're just, uh, he played a few weeks and then went home. And we said, yeah, we'll get it going. And then he came back out. And it didn't work out. But anyway. Wait, why a- didn't it work out? Because I know this guy. Yeah. I, he's I, an I amazing see, player. But I the see thing Alex was, all the time, but he's. We were more of a GNR kind of band. And he was a heavy, cheap trick guy, which was like yes. what, what LSD was. And uh, also later, uh, my my drummer played with Alex, this guy, Eddie Reuter, and they played together and had a band, and Eddie also played in LSD. Um, so flash, fast forward a couple years later, Alex's band gets this deal, and we go to a concrete convention over at the Burbank uh, Airport. Those must have been amazing. Yeah. I remember and that. And there the he is, some fucking forum, shit right? ass stole my money. You know, some fucking shit ass stole my money. And here it is, this homeless guy, which he created a character, which is a lot like you creating a character. And his I char- know, it's, it's His character funny, fucking parallels. backfired, though, because he had to be stinky and homeless and everything all the time. But he was mind-boggling to see the guy sing his moves. He looked like, uh, basically, he looked like Elvis Costello. You know what? If but he lived in the garden. The thing camp. is, the thing you got to understand is that the character in me were really. W- <sighs> there was okay. I'll tell you everything so you know. Yeah. The only thing about like me on MTV that was a character <laughs> was the voice. You said was the voice and the personality. Right. Which I guess is a lot, but you know, like my sp- yeah, my, my, that's the character. <laughs> yeah, right? but the way I dressed is how I would address because that's always like how I thought I was cool. Here's the thing: no one but me right. came up with the clothing that I wear now, or the clothing. Well, listen, if I'm acting in something or yeah. or or whatever, yeah, I, no, then that's something different. But like when I'm on the street, but basically, yeah, I mean, like you know, like. Carson would be like, you know, dre- basically when I was a VJ, the lineup of people were um, Carson Daly. Carson Daly, Matt Pinfield. Oh yeah, Matt Pinfield. Matt Pinfield, Kurt Loader. Twenty minutes. Kurt, Kurt Loader and John Norris. Mm-hmm. I got some nuts. So John Norris stories and Matt Pinfield yeah. stories, but yeah. um, and Kurt Loader stories, but um, and uh, Ananda Lewis, who was like a really cool girl, like Serena Altul. Now, who out of all those were egomaniacs down there? Because you got to think these guys had to be like, I, I'm the fucking star of MTV. No, everyone was pretty cool Is because that right? everyone, yeah, because I mean, like, I was like this 18 year old, like, crazy kid, but like, I was so. It was clear that I was good natured, you know yeah. what I mean? I mean, I don't know, I think. I mean, so and, and no one, no, no one thought like, oh, this guy's gonna. Uh, basically, the thing was is that the whole contest, um, with like basically you got to be a VJ on MTV for two weeks yeah. if you won. Oh, that and was you got it, two five, weeks, and you got five thousand dollars. Yeah, and like a, and then and something possibly from Old Navy, which what the fuck? <laughs> um, no, it was twenty five thousand dollars. What? It was twenty five thousand dollars. Really? Which would be Did like? Did you get that? I got that. Wow. Yeah. Half, but right? Because of taxes. I don't even know. Right. I had an, I had an accountant within the the week, and then basically, like, you know, um, I did so well, and it became, basically, like, you know, I now I sound like I'm. I'm bragging and I don't mean to, it's but not about you know, that. it's just about getting the story. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, you know, and um, so you start killing it. People are loving you. I'm like, killing it. It becomes, and then there is also this thing like, oh my god, you know, like it was like one of us is on here, like you know, because not a disenfranchised youth type thing, but kind of, you know, yeah. like where it was like, you know, like um, yeah, you know, there's there's finally like a stoner or like a crazy kid. Yeah, you know. I mean, I think I'm just like James Franco. Like, you know, I I might seem stoned, but I'm not. Right, know? right. I, I just totally your gardener that was smoking a spliff out there. <laughs> just gotta make that clear. Okay, so you, uh, you, um, so you yeah, so, I, so basically, the, oh, oh, yeah. So real quick, then, um, so basically, like the two week deal then becomes like, um, oh, well, then we'll sign him for another three months. They give me my own show at the Jersey Shore called Lunch with Jesse, which yeah. would air every day from like 11.30 to 12. 
So you're this out is how Jersey the hair metal. Shore. This is a very important part of the MTV story if we're going to really cover it and yeah, then pertaining are. to hair hair metal. So basically, like um, MTV for the, this is actually like when MTV would play videos for half the day and like all their stuff would be coming from like one central studio. So basically, like MTV was broadcasting like you know eight hours a day from New Jersey. From you know this was way before Jersey Shore, but of from course. that same I from that it. same town, Seaside Heights. You know and. Um, yeah, because um, Jersey still loved rock. Oh, loved Jersey it. still Jersey. loved rock I then, think and that's the whole beauty of this. So basically, MTV gives me this like show that would air f like Monday through Friday, like you know from eleven thirty to twelve, where it's like five interview segments. And are you and living in Jersey? Or I'm living in Jersey during yeah. the week for and this. Are you just screwing like Jersey rock chicks with that ah teased up hair stuff. Look at it, it's Jesse Camp. Are you fucking chicks or what's going on? Out yeah, there? but I mean that was some that that's always some. It, it's <sighs> you hold so, back on stuff like drugs and pussy. No, no, guys. I don't. I won't. It's hey, like, it's like twenty years ago, fifteen years ago. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, it's just. But I mean, are you get you're getting groupies, right? Yeah. Yeah. No. I, it, I gotta be honest, Dean. Yeah, yeah. I like to flash back to different periods. That'd be hard if Jesse Camp was gay. <laughs> You're like, oh, actually, I was gay the whole time. <laughs> yeah, are you gay? <laughs> Look at you, dude. Are you serious? I don't know. I'm just asking oh, you questions. Yo. It doesn't matter. No, that's cool. It doesn't matter. I love gay guys. I love <laughs> heterosexual guys. I love fucking freaks. I love crazies. I love artists. I love them all. You know? Right? I'll tell you a couple things about me first okay. off. You know, it was uh it was late. It was uh it was at Bob Costas's house. Johnny Weir is there. And, you know, we were just having absinthe. I don't know what happened, but that does not make me gay. <laughs> you, wait, you had gay sex at Bob Costa's house? Wait, I hope I made that joke right. Who is the um, the <laughs> figure skater that does commentary at the Olympics? I don't know. I don't know. But oh, I thought okay. you were giving me a no, funny scoop. No, <laughs> okay. no, no, Dean, so, let me, let me, let me. I'm no. fucking with you the whole Dean, way through. I'm well, fucking with you the whole way through. And I like through. it. Well, no, yeah. this is what so I was. Sign a record. Deal. Well, no, let me, but because you touched on an interesting thing, and it would be horrible if I didn't pass this over. Okay. No, I have, um, yeah, oh, my God. You know what? That's a. That's a whole other TV show, like to put out there. Maybe if the one I'm trying to to make now, like, goes somewhere, like you know, this could be a sequel thing. But like, um, yeah, basically. Oh my God, yeah, I've had crit so many crazy girls. But then I'm thinking, like, it was a weird. That whole year was weird because that kicked off with, um, like, the year kicked off with like Hanson girls because like basically somehow like I hosted like this live Hanson concert and then all of a sudden I became huge with Hanson girls and but it was really weird because they were all like little kids and stuff and I was like 18 but then like yeah at, at, it was actually at the Jersey Shore where yeah where the pussy got real interesting that year you know <laughs> what I mean because there were there were like there were a lot of older women that were like rocker chicks cougars. there that were in the mix. Yeah, there was cougars before yeah. there were cougars. Yeah, yeah, right, right. But like it was like the cougars always had like a weird goth daughter right. or like a weird like because you know what? During this time era, during that summer, that was like when Marilyn Manson, you know, it was such a, it was really kind of a cool era because it was during that summer when like rock music. Here's the thing. I got a really good point here with this. Yeah. You got to follow me. Help me get to my, my main points. But I'm trying to. I'm going to hit on the big milestones. Okay. And we'll start with Elvis. Yeah, we did that. Then rock changes to the Beatles. Yep. Stones. Yep. Arguably. 70s, you got Led Zeppelin. Zeppelin. Maybe Eagles. Al Alice Cooper. Boston. Kiss, Eagles. Boston. Eh. I love Boston. Right, yeah, I'm even, just saying. Huge Boston fan. E even love the new, new Boston album that came out last year. No, nah, that was garbage. Has some great songs. Come on. Heaven on earth. Come on. I can't believe it. It was horrible. It. Here's really? Boston. You only need one, two, and three. And two and one and two. Well, you want to know? No. My, you want to know my favorite Boston album? God, you always pick the bunk later ones. <laughs> okay, what is it? Although as much as I love Corporate America, their fourth album, I'm yeah. a huge third stage <laughs> fan. 
I saw that tour. I'm gonna it wasn't take bad. you by the hand and make you realize, oh, yeah. Amanda. Amanda. Can't you say you That's believe three, in right? me? That's the Can't you record. say you believe in me? Yeah. That I saw third that stage, tour. that was killer record. That was killer. They had the giant, the biggest pipe organ in the world on stage. And then, you know, there's also great... Now, if you're a Boston fan during that time period, yep. there were two albums. Gary Peel on guitar from... Uh, Barry Goudreau, yeah. who was on the first two records, didn't write anything, but played on them. Um, basically, he made a solo record in 1980, all sung lead vocals by Brad Delph. Dope. So it's pretty much like an un, like unreleased Boston record. That kicks butt. And then then he formed a band called Orion the Hunter, and they yeah. had this huge song, So I You Ran. That. Yeah. Yeah, that's all Boston byproduct. I mean, you, you know your rock, which is cool. Yeah, I'm a you huge know your fanatic. Rock. I understand it. Now, uh, you get the record deal. Yeah. You you do a two-song demo without. Oh, final King. thing, really quick. Okay. So I was going, so, okay, getting off Boston. Basically, let's just... Again, Elvis, Beatles, Stones, Zeppelin, um, The Clash, let's yeah, say. Yeah, of course. Guns N' Roses. Aerosmith. Um, Nirvana. And then basically the next big movement that happened was brewing that summer. And I'm talking about basically that fall, after we finished the Jersey Shore, when I got back to New York, and then they actually, then my manager got them to renew my contract again. Right. Last ni- we're talking last 99? two weeks. You were talking ninety eight. No, so then yeah. I got I got renewed again till December. TRL starts in September. Basically that August, I went on the road with Corn for two weeks before their album came out. Follow the leader with Got the Life. Right. That comes out, blows up. Like Marilyn Manson, the dope show comes out. The video with him in his breast. Yeah. That yeah. was like the last awesome. time when with Corn and Marilyn Manson. Arguably with the Strokes a couple years later, but that's it. That, that shit's that, killed. That's the last time. We got Strokes, Yeah, Yeah, Yes, and Kings of Leon all in that era right there. Okay, fair enough. That's yep. the last time rock was dangerous. That's right. You're correct. And, and Now, but, where I fit into all of this yeah. was that basically I wanted to kind of, I thought Corn and Limp Bizkit, even Limp Bizkit were cool. I mean, in their own way, you know. I mean, because it was dangerous, you know, the Deftones, it was dangerous. These new metal kids, it was scary at first. It wasn't yeah. this rap rock We've backlash. We missed Metallica somewhere in there, which is the kings of danger for a long time, you know? Uh, I Metallica mean, were only dangerous to me around uh, Master but, of Pop, well, uh, from Inception yeah. through Injustice for All. Uh, maybe a, maybe album, a little into the Black Album, but... <laughs> By the time, but true. But but yeah, but by the time Sabbath True and Through the Never came out, they yeah. were fucking milking that shit. Actually, I take that back. I was a huge fan. Yeah. And this is again just in my mindset. I remember Jerry Garcia dying. I remember being that. around the exact same time that Metallica's Load came out. Yeah, I didn't like. And Load. I remember when they cut their hair yeah. and they put out Until It Sleeps. I didn't like that stuff. I thought that was actually really ballsy and cool on their part, and I dug that album, and I'm actually one of the only people that digs Load. Yeah, Florentine loves Load, too. I don't like I it. Had a lo- I've had a lot of crazy run-ins with Metallica over the years. Yeah, me too. One of my most rock and roll moments, I don't think he'll mind me saying it, because no I know he's a lot different now, but I remember during the MTV era, like, you know, going to Marilyn Manson show, this is after MTV, and like just like doing coke with... What and, the fuck um, is that? Oh, press something on my computer. There you go. Mid mid cocaine talk. My yeah. computer just came on. Great. Now that's yeah. crazy. That is crazy. Because that Napster era happened a little later. But you know what? It's been such an amazing life. I mean, like I you don't even. I mean, we'll save it for another time if you want. No, but I man, mean, what just are you like we're not in a hurry. Let me okay. tell you something. When my I'm adventures tell you. post MTV. Fucking crazy. Not I got yet. involved. Let's talk about that. I got involved with this. You're selling firearms? Was that right you told me, or was that just bullshit on the street? Listen, yeah. I've <laughs> in my life, I have sold firearms before. Right. I've never sold, like, machine gun level guns. How did you, know? you get into selling I've never firearms? Been, I've never been at a, like, you know, found myself at a Walmart just outside of Atlanta. Let me think of a... Hey, you want to see how good my geography is? Yeah. Give me any... Check this out. Because uh-huh. of because of how how hard and how much I've extensively toured this country and I'm yeah. proud of it. Give me any city and I'll tell you some some suburbs of it. Well, no, I get no, it. no, just no, just okay. as a, Oklahoma. As a, all right, great. Oklahoma doesn't have much, but it has um, 
uh, Norman, Edmund, uh, American City, um, Oklahoma City is its main part. O- and then I'll tell you a um, really interesting thing about Oklahoma City, actually. On my very first road trip before MTV, this is a great story. Yeah. I got a great story. Because I think <laughs> that you like a lot of different things, and this is a freaking awesome story. <laughs> So anyway, you got to be the hardest interview I've ever done. Trying to wrangle you. You have worse ADD than me. I love it. But no, because this, because there's, because there's so much stuff. That, yeah, you have a ton that's, of stories. That's even more interesting. Than MTV, check this out. Yeah. So these, I'll give you just two stories of things that happened with me and my sister on on our nine month road trip before MTV, which totally transformed me from like a New England kid into like being like a fucking like a street kid. Got it. Is that so? Like um. We were in uh, Louisiana. We had left New Orleans. We had left Baton Rouge. I believe that we were kind of like between Baton Rouge and Lafayette. Yeah. And like, so we were kids and we were basically, we'd sleep in our car, you yeah, know yeah. what I mean, at night. And so like, we were like, but sometimes it was during the summer, it was hot. So we would like try to find a church yeah. and always sleep in a church parking lot back then. Now, if you wanted, you could like sleep in any Walmart parking lot you want, but we didn't know that back then. Right. So we would always be like, well... And we would get woken up by the cops, like, all the time. But, like, once the cops would run your ID and whatever, they'd be, like, cool. Cops weren't in, like, you could still travel the country. In fact, like, when my sister and I were, like, like we were in L.A. for, like, two months during that, like, in 1997, every night we'd always get so scared of, like, sleeping in, you know, sleeping in L.A. that we would always drive the car all the way out to Santa Clarita. Wow. And Magic it, Mountain parking lot? Yeah. They were sleeping out there? <laughs> no, like a church parking lot out there, like in 1997. You guys were commuting to stay in your car. That's hilarious. Fucking crazy. But it's crazy. smart, though, because you could well, be We sleeping. had the mobile gas car. We didn't care. We kind of yeah. liked having Santa Clarita. Well, Hollywood was base. gangster even It was gangster years back ago. then, Fuck big yeah. time. 15 years ago, it was crazy. Crazy yeah, shit. Yeah, fuck yeah, dude. Yeah, no, like mid nineties, definitely, and and New York was too. I yeah, mean, hell like, yeah, you know, fifty cent, uh, forty uh, second Street was like. I'll put it to you this way: back then, I lived in like I lived in on I lived on Houston and Avenue A for like five years in New York, and like um, like back then, Avenue A was hip, Avenue B was kind of bad c was like crack and d was death yeah you know <laughs> now you go to new york and it's like you know like clean fucking, clean clean yeah you can't get a reservation on avenue d for like a f- french restaurant you're like what the fuck happened yeah right but getting back to um oh shit oh yeah so really quick two great stories um so basically we're in louisiana so we're sleeping in this backwoods town and, like, some guy, like, wakes us up kind of, like, in the middle of the night. And he's like, why are you guys sleeping on there? And we're like, uh, you know, oh, well, you know, we were just crashing here for the night. He's like, I live at the house right next door. You can crash at my house. And we were like, okay. Even though, you know, it was yeah. like, kind of could be a serial killer. Anyway, so, like, um, my sister and I, then he, you know, we have to talk with him for an hour. I think he was, like... On some kind of speed, we didn't know that at the time. We were so naive. But then he eventually conked out. We conked out, like, on these couches. And then I, you know, but then I had to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. I wake up. I open the door. I think it's a bathroom. I feel for a light. There's a light switch. Turn it on. What do I see in the closet? A Ku Klux Klan outfit. No. Really? Right here. Is it basically, you know, we're crazy. We were obsessed with that movie, uh, Silkwood, yeah. starring uh, Meryl Streep and Cher and uh, Kurt Russell, I think, in the 70s. You know what it's about? Nope. Silkwood? I don't. Okay, long story short, basically, Karen Silkwood works at a power plant in Crescent, Oklahoma. And this is a real true story. And basically, it finds out, you know, this is like the 70s. They build this power plant in like this poor town that's like basically like just an hour north of Oklahoma City, which is already really backwards there. Anyway, long story short, Karen Silkwood is this woman, and she's and they have like a union and all this. She finds out like that, you know, like the, the power plant is actually like extremely radioactive and poisoning everything in the area, and that like you know it's actually poisoning her and stuff. Right. So somehow she oh, gets yeah, yeah, I know she gets talking. in touch with like a New York Times reporter, you know, like and basically kind of spills the thing to him. But before she can get to that meeting with him, someone drives her off the road, like murders her by like driving her off the road. Right. So she can never get to him and then like tries and then steals those files that she had. <laughs> 
That's, That's a true, true story. story. Right. So I remember, so we were like in Oklahoma City, which was like the weirdest. And Oklahoma City still is to me mm -hmm. the weirdest city maybe in America because it's such a weird, like it's stuck in the 70s type place. Weird Back shit. then, oh my God, like Oklahoma City, I remember it had like, it had this one record store in it that this is because I remember seeing Oklahoma City for the first time. Oklahoma Red had this like record store. Uh, but don't put Hammett on that list. That's not fair anymore. But, um, <laughs> you know, and shout outs to Beaumont. I own. Shout I own, outs to Beaumont. I do actually own. I'm doing I a, own a show piece with, of property in Beaumont. I'm doing a show with uh, Jay Moore at the Fox in Bakersfield May 10th. So wait, I, I, Bakersfield. Wait a Fox minute. Theater. You wait a come? minute. Yes, I do want to come. And we got to talk about that. Listen, because that could make an epic episode of the new thing that yeah. i'm working okay, on okay now listen which i'll tell you about i gotta go to san diego right now will you come back yeah. sunday for part two yeah i'd love Promise? to yeah because we're, we're we're just touching the fucking scratch in the surface are you sure this is all interesting yeah, still what are you talking about dude okay it's great so listen you'll come back sunday i if I you would more have than come back today, sunday we would have finished it so you got to <sighs> come back sunday i'd say around two o'clock or something i do have to say yep. i'm not the best I am a very good driver, but it's a very interesting. Like, let's say you're eating at the one on one cafe, yeah, and then I love you have it. to kind of mad all the time. I saw you, you. You there's a billboard for you. That's right, Dean Del Rey. Yeah, the Del Rey. Uh, it's Del a picture Razor of you. sandwich. Yeah, you gotta get a Del Razor sandwich. <laughs> yes. All right, let's do. Uh, you're amazing. Hold on. Yeah. Really quick. Okay. Final thing. Okay. Let me final final thing that he's out of here. Yeah, yeah. Because you you know, yeah. but Bakersfield, the armpit of Bakersfield yep. is called Oildale. I know it. That's where corn's from. N kind of. Right. But kind they wrote of. That song Oildale. The, they wrote Oildale because mm -hmm. me and my older sister years on because I've done so much cool stuff since MTV. We made this film project going through all these backwoods towns and film all kinds of crystal meth addicts in Oildale. Yeah. So I see Jonathan Davis like a year before that song comes out. I tell him about like, you know, because I remember he's from Bakersfield. I tell him, dude, you know all about Oildale. And we have like a talk about it. He's like, dude, I ought to do a song called Oildale. Yeah. And it, Oildale is the armpit. But yep. if you're in Jay Moore, because I've met Jay o coolest guy. Yeah, right? We got to do something where we film we'll the Bakersfield so Adventure. Definitely. Out. Now listen to this. Before, right. before we go to part two on Sunday, YouTube Dean Del Rey Corn and watch that video. And then I'll just right. leave you with that. Alright, there he is. We'll go to part two uh, on Sunday. Uh, Jesse Camp, MTV VJ. Uh, Alright, we'll pick it up from there when we come back. Damn! <laughs>